Welcome to your market brief for Monday, December 9 from the NASDAQ market site. I'm Jack Otter in for Caroline Woods. Let's get the week started. On the earnings front, we'll hear from Chewy, GameStock, Lululemon, Costco, Adobe, and Broadcom. We'll get the final FOMC rate decision of 2019, though the market is not expect expecting a rate cut. Uh, plus, we'll have our eye on key U.S. reports on retail and the health of the U.S. consumer. The U.K. will hold general elections on Thursday as Prime Minister Boris Johnson seeks a majority control. Christine Lagarde will also give her first monetary policy announcements as president of the ECB. But first, Caroline recently spoke with Mohamed El Arian, chief economic advisor to Allianz. They unpacked his economic outlook for Europe and also discussed if U.S. recession fears are overblown. Watch this. You seem pretty confident that the U.S. consumer will continue to prop up this economy. But what about manufacturing, the slowdown in manufacturing? Does that cause you concern at all? So undoubtedly, the U.S. is suffering like others from a slowdown in manufacturing. That is a global phenomenon, and it has to do with trade, but also with innovation and technological disruption. So unquestionably, that's an issue. However, so far, it has not contaminated the rest of the economy. And in particular, it hasn't contaminated the labor market. And as long as that continues, which I think it will, it means that the consumer can remain strong. We are going to continue to create jobs. I suspect wage growth is going to remain above 3%, and that's a pretty solid labor market so far into the cycle. If we do see those 15% tariffs go into effect on December 15th, those are on consumer goods, and I doubt that many businesses will take them on themselves. They probably will be passed along to us, to the consumer. Does that concern you at all, if the consumer is who's really propping up this economy, that uh, we're hit with yet another expense, and, and or what, I guess, could weaken the consumer to a point where they're not propping up the economy any longer? So I don't know whether we're going to get what's called a pass-through, which is costs go up and therefore prices go up. What we've seen so far is that the higher costs have been shared. They've been shared with the suppliers, means China, mm -hmm. and on the profit side. And they haven't had a material impact on profits because this is a great time for corporate profitability. Um, if there is a change in behavior, which is hard because these companies operate in a global environment. It's not as if China is the only sourcing of these products. They get sourced from elsewhere. So there's a reason why the companies haven't felt confident to pass through prices. If that behavior changes, which I think is a big if, capital I, capital F, if it changes, then yeah, it's going to impact consumption. And does that change your recession forecast then? No, because I don't think it's going to change. I don't think that behavior is going to change. I think corporations are going to wait as long as they can before they pass the, the higher cost into prices. Let's move on to central banks and, and interest rates. Are, in terms of the interest rate outlook, are central banks on the right track? So it depends what you define by track. If the right track means we can continue to implement unconventional policies, which in Europe includes negative interest rates, that is now the wrong track. I think there's enough evidence to make us worry that the collateral damage and unintended consequences of protracted reliance, excessive reliance on central banks, far exceed the benefits. If the right track is we're going to re-examine how we do things, which is what the ECB is saying and what the Fed is doing, they're doing these strategic reviews, then yes, because I think that we are at a point where not only are central banks becoming ineffective in stimulating the economy, they're becoming counterproductive. What do you see for the larger economies in Europe? Are we reaching a bottom? No. And I think the market has fallen in love with this notion that Europe has bottomed. And I think that the markets will be disappointed. If you want to talk about a recession risk, Europe is not flashing yellow, it's flashing red. Um, we are seeing no pro-growth policies emerging at all. The latest developments, political developments in, in Germany means that very little will materialize out of there. So this continent is hitting what's, what economists call, uh, call stall speed, below 1% growth. And once you hit stall speed, the risk of recession goes up significantly. To see the rest of Caroline's interview with Mohammed, head to barons.com and marketwatch.com. Shifting to the streaming wars, recently Barron's cover story, Television's Big Test,
focused on the winners and losers in content streaming. We continue our coverage with Tuna Amobi, equity analyst and director with CFRA, where he focuses on the media landscape. Welcome, Tuna. So you have described the current era of entertainment as a golden era. Unpack that for us. That's right. Um, so I think we're actually in the very early innings right now of this migration from traditional television to uh, streaming or internet-based television. Um, there's a number of factors that we see uh, facilitating this, whether it's kind of demographic, secular trends in broadband penetration, the influence of millennials. This is something that we expect to continue for, for quite some time. So that's why I call it the new golden era of streaming television. So right now, uh, Netflix is ahead in this era with 60 million subscribers in the U.S. alone. Uh, Disney recently launched nicely. Uh, do they need to hit 60 million or so to be successful, and can they? Well, Jack, I got to tell you, when Disney said the first day signups on Disney Plus was almost 10 million, that kind of blew away all, um, you know, expectations that we had, kind of leading us to believe that their target for 60 to 90 million subscribers for Disney Plus in the next five years, um, I think they're off to a terrific start. And we see really potential upside to, to those projections. And Netflix, obviously, having one of the first mover advantages, uh, they've got, you know, competition from Disney and others breathing down their necks. Uh, I think this is going to play out for, for quite some time. So one of the ways Netflix got there was to borrow a lot of money to buy content. That's getting more and more expensive, and their cash burn rate is over $2 billion a year. Is that sustainable? Indeed. I think you know, the cash burn for, for, for them is going to get even higher. This year, we're kind of looking at north of $3 billion. Uh, and and you, know, you can understand why. They need to spend even more aggressively uh, to kind of make their content uh, more competitive with guys like Disney and, and, and Comcast and um, everyone else kind of jumping into the fray. Uh, we expect the uh, inflection in free cash flow for Netflix to be potentially pushed out in the next three to four years as they continue to spend even more aggressively to remain competitive. And remember, they have also about 20 billion of streaming content obligations that makes us believe that the spending is going to stay you know, elevated in the next few years. But you're still bullish on the stock. We still like the stock for a variety of reasons, of which one of them is that they have the first uh, you know, early mover advantage and they actually have seen the handwriting on the wall from all of these streaming war competition that's coming up. So speaking of competition, I think there are more than 200 over-the-top offerings in this space. I can't imagine that that won't thin out over time. It will. Um, and, and our thesis is that that number uh, is going to get whittled down significantly uh, to maybe no more than a few dozen players. And that shakeout probably happens in the next three to five years. Uh, that being said, next year is going to define for us um, you know, how that trajectory is going to play out when Comcast um, and, and uh, other entrants continue to uh, make investments. Uh, there will be multiple winners and losers, we think, across various categories, whether it's content, business models, and uh, all kinds of uh, genres, news, sports, and entertainment. So speaking of Comcast, I find that an interesting company because on the one hand, it's a legacy player, right? It looks like it's going to be a victim of disruption. On the other hand, it is providing the pipes through which all this disruption will, will flow. So what do you see it as, more of a winner or more of a disruptor? I think Comcast is going to uh, be a, a potential you know, winner. And remember also they acquired NBC Universal. So on the content side, they are also positioned themselves to be a viable streaming player. But more importantly, I think the broadband business gives Comcast a very good toehold in these streaming wars where you know their pipes are going to be increasingly even more important uh, whether you want to uh, you know subscribe to uh, HBO or uh, or any other unaffiliated player you need a very robust you know broadband pipe thank you very much tuna uh, and before you go uh, we voted you voted in our market watch poll on where markets will be by the end of the year higher lower or no significant change the results a virtual three-way tie this week we're asking if you could only have one streaming service, what's your choice? Netflix, Disney Plus, Amazon Prime, or something else? Find us on Twitter and vote. We want to hear from you. That concludes today's Market Brief. I'm Jack Otter. Don't forget to join me 10 p.m. Eastern Friday nights on Fox Business for the Barron's Roundtable. And we want to hear your thoughts. We're asking where you believe the strongest investment opportunity will be in 2020. Are you looking to U.S. stocks, European stocks, European bonds, commodities? Let us know.